to What's Next on WHIS. And welcome back to What's Next, WHIS, 1440 AM, 97.3 FM, online, whisradio.com, on your phone with the My Radio To Go app, and on your Facebook feed, facebook.com slash what's next, WHIS. My name is Matt Deal, happy to be your host, happy to be joined up next by Alex Davidson, who is the Director of Public Affairs at the Beer Institute, talking to me on the 90th anniversary of the repeal of Prohibition with the signing of the Cullen Harrison Act in 1930. Me today. Thanks for having me, Matt. So, you know, before we get to some of the from then to now, let's talk about that little moment. Set the scene for me a little bit of, uh, you know, the prohibitions going on back in, uh, you know, 1933, but finally the, the forces have come together to sign the Cullen Harrison Act. What was it that uh, finally sort of brought the forces together to overturn prohibition, other than the fact that people were going wild in the streets? I was going to say, I mean, I think first and foremost, it wasn't popular. Um, it's something that had been put in place in the early 20s, and they just it, it didn't have the intended consequences that the proponents of it wanted. The people were upset. Uh, it's something that FDR ran on, was repealing prohibitions. So in uh, March, March of 1933, so March 21st, Congress passed the Colin Harrison Act, and then it was actually signed the next day by FDR, who famously said, I think it's a good time for a beer when he signed it. So what it allowed was for the sale of low alcohol beer. So that's 3.2% alcohol content or below. Oh, wow. And so this was, this was the, the precursor to the full repeal. So the full repeal of Prohibition ended up happening in December. That had to be ratified by the states. It took until December for each of the states to go in order. And uh, Utah became the 36th date to ratify the 21st Amendment on December 5th. So, you know, hit me up in December. We're going to be celebrating that as well. But um, what's really special about the Colin Harrison Act is that it, it really celebrates the uniqueness of beer. So it was signed March 22nd. It went into effect April 7th, and April 7th is now National Beer Day. Oh. So we celebrate how beer was allowed back um, a little before everybody else because, you know, it's a special product. It's unique, and it's what the people wanted. And you said 3.2 or below is what it allowed, which immediately caught my attention because the standard for, I mean, your your average lightest of light beers for the most part, standard commercial beer is going to be around like 5% in this day and age. So it makes me wonder about, I, I'm sure it probably had to be 5% or more before Prohibition came in. So the, the average alcohol content of beer is still below 5% um, if you look at the whole spectrum. So that's okay. everything from craft beer to macro beers. But they they actually, a lot of it was the idea that it was too low to be intoxicating. So that ah. was a lot of the logic back then. And, um, you know, it's something that brewers have really been reinvesting in now. They look at low alcohol and no alcohol beers, and that's one of the fastest growing categories in the beer industry because people are looking for that experience. They want, you know, to have the beer with their friends. They want to be able to go to a bar and order something, but not necessarily have something with a lot of alcohol in it. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for, for beer culture and experiencing the moment with, with people. And, um, you know, we've been giving people that opportunity in different forms for, I mean, hundreds and, and thousands of years. Well, and again, speaking with Alex Davidson, who is uh, the Director of Public Affairs with the Beer Institute since it's 90 years since the signing of the, the Cullen Harrison Act. And I definitely uh, want to want to touch a little bit on some of that, uh, what you talk about, that, that beer culture now, because obviously things have changed quite a bit. And, and in this day and age, uh, one thing that I've joked about plenty on the show is I've talked with you know, folks who have breweries and other folks who just run, run bars and once upon a time when I started playing shows, there were, you know, three beers on tap, and that was just the, the, the big three you know, and then that was pretty much going to be it. And also people were, I know, it was just bars. There were bars were the place, and people drank in a specific way that they kind of drink at bars. And through the years, suddenly it's become a whole lot more breweries that have who knows how many <laughs> dozens, perhaps, of options and exactly. people are out there with their family and their children and their dogs. And it's, 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 there's been a specific change of beer culture, it seems, in the last 10 to, 10 to 15 years, I'd say. 
So beer culture, I mean, has always been great in America. I mean, it traces itself back to the Revolutionary War soldiers were allocated uh, beer per day. But you saw in the, in the late 70s, there was only 50 brewers in the United States. Um, and that just ex- expanded exponentially. And now there's more than 6,600 brewers in every corner of the country. Every congressional district has them. And it, you know, through the, the growing of the products, the production of beer, uh, retail distribution, there's now more than 2 million jobs in the United States that rely on the beer industry, um, producing uh, $331 billion in economic output. So if, if you run the numbers, that's about 1.6% of GDP is directly tied to beer. And in West Virginia, that's, that's nearly 7,000 jobs and $275 million dollars in wages and a billion dollars in economic impact. So it's, it's something that's grown massively. And, you know, there's, there's never been a better time to be a beer consumer because there's a brewery in every corner and there's, you know, people always say, well, you know, maybe I don't like beer. And I'm like, you haven't found the beer you like yet. There's 20,000 options out there and I'm sure there's something for everybody. You know, there really, it it really is a lot of times. I mean, it's fairly surprising because again, Generally, when folks say, I don't like beer, there's that classic definition of nothing against them. You know, there's, I, I have mine. I yeah. think the classic commercial ones that I, that I like that, cause that's all we had for a time. These children don't know, but, but, uh, <laughs> still that's their, they, they think of beer and they think of a Bud Light or something, but then that's very different than say a sour or, you know, mm-hmm. a, a dark rich porter or, you know, there's just a whole different world of beers that didn't even seem possible when I was young. <laughs> Yeah, and I think there's, you know, an unbelievable amount of innovation happening every day. So when you think of your traditional beers and then you use sours and every time I go to a local brewery, there's something that I could have never even imagined happening. So, you know, brewmasters are coming up with crazy new ideas, um, new flavors, new styles. And that's something that I also of like the beer, um, I would say the beer organizations, the ones that you know, judge beer and, and create the style guides, you know, they're constantly updating what they have because it's, it's constantly evolving. Well, again, I'm speaking with Alex Davidson, who's the director of public affairs with the beer Institute. And I got a couple more questions about uh, like kind of the, the, the beer uh, economy and industry as it is. But before I do that, I'd like you to allow you the opportunity to tell me a little bit more about the Beer Institute and what it is that you guys do there. It sounds like it's got to be a rough job. It's, it's tough, but somebody's got to do it. Um, <laughs> so the Beer Institute is a trade association. So we're based in Washington, D.C., and we're actually the second oldest trade association in Washington. We were founded in 1862 amidst the Civil War. They levied the first excise tax on beer to help fund the union. So there's a group of brewers, um, primarily German immigrants who had just moved to the United States who said, you know what, we want to do our civic duty. We're going to join together, help collect that excise tax. And ever since then, we've been, you know, working in Washington and in states around the country trying to educate lawmakers, consumers, the media about the beer industry, the economic impact of beer, the cultural significance of beer, and making sure that any decisions that are made legislatively allow beer to continue to flourish. Well, let me let's talk a little bit about some of that the the economic uh, situations with beer because one thing that I do wonder that I've been fascinated about is I've been I've been just on my own bias from having venues to play at and as a guy that likes uh, tasty beers, been happy to see the expansion of the craft beer industry. But I have always wondered if there's a certain point of saturation or a, a sort of a wall that it could hit. And uh, recently, just here in the last few days. A, a, a great local brewer, Greenbri- Greenbrier Valley Brewing Company, has announced that they're going to be at least reformulating. They shut down their st- operations mm-hmm. for the meantime. And do, do you ever, do you see anything nationally that sort of says anything to the degree of, oh, well, maybe it's hitting a limit, or is that craft beer market still kind of growing and expanding in a lot of different pockets? Well, I think you see that it's, it's constantly expanding. I think there was a huge booming growth um, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Um, where it really hit its peak um, in just velocity. Yeah, but I think you you know you reach a point where there are there are literally breweries in every corner, every town in America at this point has one. Um, 
So there's lots of options for people. It's really created a lot of opportunity. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, do you make a good product and do you make people happy? So yeah, it's not a zero sub game, I guess. Yeah. What? I said, no, I guess it's not a zero sum game. There's, there's there's still always more people to draw in. There's always more people to draw in and and people have changing, um, you know, changing interests. And and a lot of it, I mean, we talked about this before I came on, it has a lot to do with the environment. You know, you create a, a great, local community gathering spot that has music and games and, and brings people together. Um, you really can't beat that. This is very true. This has been the, uh, the strong, while uh, obviously delicious beer has been uh, one thing that a lot of the breweries that have been successful have in common. I would say that's the other element. It's sort of a gathering point of the community that other, other places don't quite serve as. So it's not quite bar, not quite all the way bar. It's just <laughs> family friendly enough that just everybody can kind of end up there. I think so. And that's one of the beauties of beer. Um, when you look at beer compared to, you know, liquor or to wine is, you know, it's on, on average, it's a lower alcohol product. It's more sessionable. It's something that has a cultural significance that, you know, you can't really get anywhere else. It's something, you know, you go to a brewery with friends and you hang out for hours and listen to live music, you hang out and play cornhole. Um, there's no real other experience better. And so one other economic question I wanted to throw at you, just that uh, you figured you might have some more uh, perspective on this and see it happening. We've been talking about craft beers and some of that. Another person who certainly noticed in uh, the popularity of craft beers has been uh, those large corporations that were making beer in the first place. They have snapped up many, uh, many, many, many a brand. Uh, is that another trend that, that, that sort of seems to continue on, that more of these brands get sucked up into the umbrella, or has there been a slowing of that? What what have you noticed in your observations? I think that it's something that you know, continues. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody wants to do is be successful. So a lot of people, they reach a certain point, and they say, you know, we've reached the, the limit of what we can do, um, and we think that our, our footprint could be bigger, and you know, someone else notices that and takes advantage of it. But I think that was a, a big thing in the last decade with a lot of mergers and acquisitions. I think that has slowed slightly. But, um, you know, it, it's just constantly adding to the portfolio. And something that I talked about earlier was those low and no alcohol versions. But um, a, lot of this, a lot of these companies, you know, they're reinvesting in the brands they already have and coming out with new products. And on top of that, you know, just innovating new stuff. So it's, it's working with what they have, expanding where they, they see fit, but just constantly listening to consumers and adapting. Um, and, you know, that's both within the macro brands as well as the micro brands. Well, lastly, before I let you go, though, since you brought that up again, I am fascinated in that. Uh, you said, did you say that was like one of the fastest growing markets? Because there certainly is a growing cultural awareness to a degree of you know, mm-hmm. people's efforts either towards sobriety or cutting back. So were you saying that that's, that's a rapidly expanding market, either low or no alcohol beers? It is. And consumers are constantly looking for something that, um, you know, feels lighter, uh, feels, you know, cleaner. And, and we've seen the rise of dry January, sober October. And these are trends that are not going away. Um, and people are looking for, lower and no alcohol options, but, you know, they still want that experience. And that's where beer is, is really unique. Um, you know, a, a mocktail is fruit juice. Um, a low or no alcohol beer is beer. And they've really adapted. There's new low and no alcohol beers coming out all the time that, you know, have the exact same flavor profile. Um, you know, you do a blind taste test, you wouldn't know the difference, except for, uh, you know, if you were to have a few of them. So it really has changed the way that people can think about it. People can experience beer. I know that, you know, personally, I, I gravitate to, to low and no alcohol beers, especially when I'm at work events and, um, you know, I need to be on my game for, for a long time. So it's, it's growing. It's something that was big in Europe already. And it's made its way over here, and I think it's here to stay. Well, I mean, even somewhere as uh, you know, rural as here, one of the uh, one of my favorite breweries anywhere, but not too far from here, called uh, Weather Ground Brewery. And they have uh, they, I, I, they have some of the best porters and stouts ever. But you know, they're those heavy hitting, you know, eleven percent mm-hmm. boys that don't play around. But they also had this series they came out with, you know, West Virginia, there's Wild and Wonderful. These were called Mild and Wonderful. One of the, <laughs> one of which being a porter that even the it, I think it was just like between three and four percent. And uh, yeah, I find myself 
kind of like you say, I've got to like play a show, got some stuff to do. Quite thankful that I could sip on a porter, but not also be committing to, uh, you know, basically getting roundhouse kicked in the head by a beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope that it never has that effect, but I think, you know, this is, it's just something that consumers like. Yeah. And yeah. I think at the end of the day, that's what the beer industry is going to provide is, um, you know, out of those 2 million jobs, a lot of those jobs are dedicated to studying consumer trends and being responsive and, you know, coming out with the next new product. And I think right now, a lot of people are looking for those. Well, uh, I've been talking with Alex Davidson, who's director of public affairs with the Beer Institute, because, again, it is the 90th anniversary of the signing of the Cullen Harrison Act back in 1933, therefore repealing prohibition but we've gone all all over the map talking about beer from back then to these days and alex davidson again i know you got a real hard job it's got to be rough working there at the beer institute and my my thoughts and prayers go out to you but i appreciate you taking awesome. the time to uh stop by and chat with me a little bit awesome thanks so much matt and i hope that uh you know everybody can celebrate that 90th anniversary today responsibly uh with a nice cold beer all right appreciate it. take care of yourself thanks matt all right, again, that was Alex Davidson, Director of Public Affairs at the Beer Institute. We're going to take a quick break. And a-